Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and this is my quarantine hair. And welcome to the summer 2020 offering of EC3084 Signals and Systems. So we've spent a lot of time looking at Fourier transforms, and these were great. Although it could handle things like decaying exponentials just fine, it really would have no idea how to handle something like a expanding exponential. But let's see if there's a trick we can do to handle functions like this. So let's remember our definition of a Fourier transform. We integrated a function against e to the minus j omega t over time. And the trick we'll use here is not to take the Fourier transform of this directly. Now, I am going to do one little tweak. For a while, we'll primarily deal with functions that are zero for t less than zero. Or there are functions that might have been doing interesting things for time less than zero, but we're not going to worry about whatever was happening for time less than zero. We're largely going to remain agnostic about what was going on. I'm going to replace the lower limit with zero minus. And I'll talk a little bit in a second about what that minus actually is. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a modified Fourier transform, crop this lower limit at zero. And what the little minus here means is that I want to make sure that that zero point is included in the integral. So if we are taking an integral of, say, a delta function at zero, that delta function is included. This is something that we only need to worry about if we have strange sort of singularities at the origin. In ordinary calculus, you wouldn't need to worry about this. I'm going to take a Fourier transform not of x of t, but a modified version of x of t. What I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply it by e to the minus sigma t. I want to emphasize that this is a sigma and not a sloppily drawn number six. Also, the sigma is just a happy variable. It doesn't indicate a standard deviation. This isn't a statistics class. So this is now what we're actually taking our Fourier transform of. This is what we've typically called x of t. But I've tweaked this x of t a little bit. OK, so now I'll still multiply this by e to the minus j omega t. Suppose that I did, in fact, have some sort of expanding exponential that I was putting into our function and trying to take the Fourier transform of. Well, I could still take a Fourier transform as long as I pick the sigma such that I have something that decays fast enough to cancel out that exponential increase. OK, so let's play with this a little bit more. We'll combine these exponents as we usually do. So I'm going to write it as x of t e to the minus sigma t e to the minus j omega t dt. I probably should have added the caveat that we're assuming that the sigma here is real valued. All right, so if we combine these things together, I can write this integral as e to the minus sigma plus j omega, all in parentheses, times t dt. And what do I have in the exponent here? Well, I have a complex number. It has a real part that's the sigma here, and it has a imaginary part that's omega. And it would be awfully convenient for me to call this something. Let's call it s. No particular reason. Let's just call it s. So I'll write this as the integral of x of t against a generic e to the minus st times dt here. So let's define this as something. Let's call it big X of s and indeed call it the Laplace transform. This description of Laplace transforms being an extension of Fourier transforms isn't at all how Laplace himself would have thought about these integrals. And although Laplace was thinking about probability and differential equations, he wasn't thinking about anything like signal and system theory as we would think about it today. So let's do an example. Let's do the same example we did for the case of the Fourier transform. I'm going to write this as e to the minus at ut. So this is a decaying exponential that starts at zero if a is bigger than zero. But now that I have this Laplace formalism, I could also have a being equal to zero, in which case this would just be a unit step function. Or I could have a being less than zero, in which case this would in fact be an expanding exponential. I can handle all of these cases now. OK, so let's plug this all in. What is the Laplace transform of e to the minus at ut? We don't really need 
to worry about what's happening with the unit step functions, since we're chopping things off at zero anyway, you could just as easily say we don't have to worry about chopping off things at the lower limit because we have this U of T here chopping off things anyway. We're going to integrate e to the minus at against e to the minus st over time. All right, so I can do my usual trick with the exponent here. Okay, so now I can just do the usual calculus. I'll write s plus a with the minus sign front in the denominator. So if I take a derivative with respect to t, this bit in the exponent will come down and cancel with this bit we have here in the denominator. And I need to evaluate this at t equal 0 minus and infinity. And now suppose for the moment that everything is sufficiently hunky-dory so that when I plug infinity in for t, this in fact goes to zero. I'll come back to that point. So assuming that occurs, the only term that actually shows up is when I plug in zero for t, and plugging in zero for t, e to the zero gives me one. So I wind up with one over s plus a. I lose this minus sign because we're plugging in the lower limit, so there's a minus. So this does look a lot like the Fourier transform. If you plugged in j omega here, Put a pin in that. That does not always work, and we'll come back to what, when, and why a little bit later. But there's a huge caveat here. This is only for particular values of s. So let's think about that a little bit more. Now, I already suggested that a could be 0, it could be bigger than 0, it could be less than 0. But in fact, a itself could be complex in the analysis that I'm about to show you. So here's the general idea. Let's focus on this exponential form here. I could split this up. I could write this as the real part of s plus j times the imaginary part of s. And multiplying this minus through for the moment, I could also say, well, let's write this as the real part of a plus j times the imaginary part of a. And remember the way we've defined this earlier, this real part we had called sigma and this imaginary part, that was sort of the original omega that came from our Fourier transform ideas. Now let me recombine this into things with a real part and things with an imaginary part. So I'm going to split this into E minus real part of S plus the real part of A and E to the minus J imaginary part of S plus imaginary part of A. And both of these things will have a T on it. Okay, so if we think about this for a second, what do these things do? Well, this term with the j in it, it's a complex valued sinusoid. It will have a real part that's a cosine, it will have an imaginary part that's a sine, and it wiggles back and forth. Whatever it's doing, both this imaginary and real part of this is going to land between minus and one and one. It's happily going back and forth. It's not doing anything weird like exploding. But if we look at this part over here, there's now a potential danger zone. This analysis here is only going to be meaningful if the real part of s plus the real part of a is bigger than zero. And we need that to happen so that this is a decaying exponential. We need it to be a decaying exponential in order for this integral here to make sense. So for instance, if the real part of s plus the real part of a was equal to zero, then we would essentially be trying to integrate from zero to infinity one of these sinusoids. It would never settle down and give us a nice, well-defined limit at infinity. And certainly, if this whole mess here was less than zero, well, then we would have an expanding exponential, and that's not going to give us a sensible integral anyway. So we wind up with a situation where, for all of this to make sense, we need the real part of s to be bigger than minus the real part of a. And this is called a region of convergence. And the reason we won't have to worry about it is that the Laplace transform as we've defined it is what's called a one-sided or unilateral Laplace transform. There's another kind of Laplace transform, unsurprisingly called the two-sided or bilateral Laplace transform, which looks at first glance as identical to the one-sided Laplace transform, except it actually goes from minus infinity to infinity. Now you might think, hey, why don't we do the bilateral Laplace transform? It looks like it can handle a much wider class of functions, and it can. 
the one-sided Laplace transform can really only handle the cases where we're worried about what happens for t bigger than zero. Now, the underlying function x of t might have been doing something else before that, but unilateral Laplace transforms can't say very much about them, whereas bilateral Laplace transforms can handle talking about what's happening for t less than zero. The problem with bilateral Laplace transforms is that they're inherently more difficult to deal with. So for the one-sided Laplace transform, we saw that e to the minus at ut Laplace transformed, and here I do mean the one-sided Laplace transform, transformed into 1 over s plus a, with a region of convergence consisting of the real part of s being bigger than minus the real part of a. With the one-sided Laplace transform, you don't really need to worry about what this is. There's going to be a unique mapping from the time domain to the Laplace domain and back, just like we saw with Fourier transforms. However, the bilateral case is much more complicated. There's not a one-to-one -one mapping here. Any particular Laplace transform could potentially map to a couple of different cases, and in order to figure out which case it maps to, you have to explicitly talk about what the region of convergence is. You have to keep track of the region of convergence to disambiguate that. Similarly, all of the properties of the bilateral Laplace transform, those also require keeping track of issues involving the region of convergence, whereas with the unilateral transform, we usually don't need to worry about it. So for that level of simplicity, and given the fact that in my experience, the unilateral Laplace transform is the one with the most practical engineering applications, I've decided to focus 3084 around the unilateral transform. There are arguments the other direction. There are certainly applications like in filter design where the bilateral transformation is useful to talk about. The bilateral transform is definitely an inherent part of the use of a lot of this kind of material in probability theory. And if you look at the lecture series of MIT 6.003 that's taught by Dennis Freeman, you'll see they spend a ton of time talking about these region of convergence issues associated with the bilateral Laplace transform, and they give lots of homework and quiz questions on it. I just think it's not worth it here. One of the reasons they do talk about the bilateral Laplace transform in 6.003 is they handle the material in a particular order. They talk about Laplace transforms first, and then talk about Fourier transforms. And if you take that approach, you really do have to talk about bilateral transforms first, because Fourier inherently, you really need to be able to handle the whole real number line for your time axis. In 3084, my preference, as you've noticed, is to talk about Fourier transforms first, and then go to Laplace transforms. And with this particular approach, what you'll find at this point is that 3084 is actually going to get easier because, at least for a while, we're going to focus on a specific subset of systems for which Laplace transforms give extremely elegant formulations, namely systems defined by linear differential equations with constant coefficients. Now, this may seem a little contradictory because I just made a big deal about Laplace transforms being able to handle functions like expanding exponentials that Fourier transforms can't handle. But in general, Fourier analysis is useful for a much wider variety of applications than the specific systems where Laplace transforms are really, really particularly handy. So let's take another transform. Well, what if we wanted to find out what the Laplace transform of cosine omega naught t ut was? You could plug this into our Laplace transform integral. Probably you would integrate by parts, but guess by now there's another clever trick you could do. Let's take the Laplace transform of e to the j omega naught t ut all over 2 plus e to the minus j omega naught t ut over 2. So we've just rewritten this cosine here using Euler's formula. So the first term here will have a Laplace transform that looks like 1 over s minus j omega naught, because I would really have to plug minus j omega naught in for a in order to get the plus that you'll see here. 
and then this term is going to transform into 1 over s plus j omega naught. Let's try to simplify this by writing everything over a common denominator. I'll take the first term and multiply the numerator and the denominator by s plus j omega naught, and I'm still left with an s minus j omega naught sitting here in the denominator. I'll multiply the numerator and the denominator by s minus j omega naught, so I'm still left with an s plus j omega naught in the denominator. And now when I simplify this, I can combine the factors in the denominator and write s squared plus omega naught squared because the two j's combine to give me a minus, which cancels with this minus. And in the numerator, I'll see that the j omega naught terms cancel out. I'll be left with 2s in the numerator, which reminds me that I forgot a factor of 2. So let me pull out my erasing power, and I'll write this as 1 half. All of this equals 1 half times all of this. So those two cancels, and that will give me an S. All right, so now I have another line in my Laplace transform table. I can say that cosine omega naught t ut transforms into S over s squared plus omega naught squared. Notice I'm being very careful to always be putting the ut here. Most textbooks aren't so careful, and we'll come back to why I'm being so particular about that in a later lecture. I won't prove it here, but you can do a similar kind of analysis on the sine function using the inverse Euler's formula to rewrite it as a sum of complex exponentials to find out that the transform of the sine function looks very much like the transform of the cosine function, except in that case we have an omega naught sitting here in the numerator instead of s. You might look at this for a second and immediately suspect that something fishy might be going on. If you think back to the Fourier transforms, we wrote that e to the minus a t ut, and here there was this condition on a being bigger than zero, transformed one into j omega plus a. Okay, so this looks very similar. I've got s plus a and one over j omega plus a. It's not a coincidence that these have a very similar form. But now if I remember back in Fourier transform land, cosines looked very different. So for instance, cosine omega naught t transformed into a thing with a couple of delta functions. There is a delta sitting at minus omega naught, and there is a delta sitting here at omega naught, and they had height of pi. Well, this certainly looks very different. The thing to remember is that back when we were doing Fourier transforms, this cosine is a cosine that was doing its thing for all time, going back all the way from before the Big Bang. Here we have a cosine that snaps on at time equals zero. So this is a very different thing. This cosine that's happening for all time gives us these concentrated spectral lines. In this case, we have a cosine that's going on for all time, but you really need to have essentially an infinite number of frequencies adding up to create this discontinuity that's sitting at zero. And okay, that was a terribly drawn instant on. We should probably draw it a little more something like this. There we go. I like that better. And although the sine wave that starts at zero and does this kind of thing doesn't have a discontinuity at zero, it does have this abrupt change. And again, you would essentially, if you're thinking about it in Fourier land, need an infinite number of frequencies to represent this. These don't actually have Fourier transforms in the usual sense anyway. There are Fourier transform expressions you can write for these kinds of instant on functions. For that matter, there is, although I don't like to talk about it, technically speaking, a Fourier transform of a unit step function. It is definitely not 1 over j omega. Nope, 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 nope. It is a weird, unnatural horror that requires a lot of special trickery to derive and then treat properly. So I would just assume you even forgot what I just said for the last minute or so. Using it can lead to all sorts of 
unpleasant chaos. The Fourier transform of the unit step, if you do try to create it and define it, uh, the Fourier transform actually blows up at the origin in two entirely different ways. So let's just not go there. Anyway, I know that by saying it, you're going to want to go look it up now. That's cool. Just remember, it's a scary, dangerous thing, and we're not going to use it in 3084.